Welcome, Nicolina. Thank you so, so much for joining. And I love it, starting with your note. This is great. Hi, everyone. So yeah, I thought we were only going to have this slide, so I added a few after, but that was the focus. Um, so this challenge really came from this one paper that was done recently um, uh, by Aaron at Edinburgh University. And they looked at all of these different multi-omics clocks in the same cohort of people. This was the Orcadis Biobank. So it was 1,000 people uh, with a 10-year follow-up. Uh, and uh, they were looking for a hospitalization of any cause. Uh, and when they looked at all of these different uh, aging clocks, what was interesting, all of them correlate because they correlate with chronological age. But when you look at the acceleration of all of these different clocks, they're measuring entirely different things. They don't correlate. And what was even more interesting is combining them doesn't work. So I think their first um, idea was let's combine all of these clocks and cre create this, um, you know, they call it a megaomic clock, and we're going to have the ultimate bi uh, biomarker of biological aging. And this biomarker was perfect at predicting chronological age, but it completely missed um, uh, any, any future health outcomes. Uh, also, some of the uh, uh, clocks which are very accurate the chronological age, like the Hanum and the Hor Horvat, they also missed uh, a lot of these future outcomes, and they're measuring different things. So the uh, glycan clock that we focus on, it moves with generalized aging, epigenetics move with general aging, uh, but metabolomics and proteomics, they were very risk specific. Uh, so if we're going to come to the, you know, if we're going to use these clocks to evaluate uh, all, all the up, up and coming longevity interventions, we're going to need a multi-omic clock, uh, multi-omic approach, because you can have different clocks moving in a different direction, which may mean that different interventions will work for different people, and of course, there'll never be a one-size-fits-all. Um, so I can talk about what we focus on, which is the uh, human glycum. Uh, we focus on the IgG glycum, but Probably a lot of you don't know what glycans are, and I, and I heard a few of you talking earlier, confusing them with glycation. This is the you know, most, most common confusion, but genes are like the blueprint. Uh, epigenetics is this instruction manual, uh, and then this makes a basic protein, but to get to this you know, fancy, in this case, um, you know, fancy electric car, uh, you need a gly the glycoprotein gives it the uh, full functionality. And we really stumbled on aging. We, we didn't look for aging. Uh, we, we came out of a glycobiology uh, lab. We're, we're the uh, only high throughput glycobiology lab globally. And we started looking at this um, uh, large cohorts of, uh, well, biobanks. So we looked at now over 150,000 people. And if you were looking at a disease, you couldn't understand the disease without knowing age of a, age of a patient. Because if you had a young person with a disease, he looked like a healthy old person. So you have to really match him well. And first this was annoying. Uh, and then we realized we're seeing some type of aging clock. It wasn't perfect to chronological age, but it did uh, associate with all of these markers of healthy or unhealthy life. Uh, and now the next step from here is, well, first also just to explain glycation and glycosylation so we don't have these uh, questions at the end. So these are entirely different processes. Uh, glycosylation is an enzymatic process. Uh, there's a network of genes involved, and they uh, give the protein their fun full functionality. While glycation destabilizes the protein and uh, is a completely different uh, process. And this is a very regulated uh, process. So first we did all of these GEOS papers and we identified this uh, network of 40 different genes which regulate IgG glycosylation. Uh, and then what's quite interesting is although, for example, with transferrin, although the structures are quite similar, there's an entirely different network of genes which regulates them. And we wanted to look at these interventions which are known to have a positive impact on, on health and health outcomes. So we looked at weight loss, uh, we looked at bariatric surgery, and we saw that uh, six months post-surgery, there was a reduction of about nine years in a cohort of 40 men. Uh, in, in the glycan clock. And we also looked at a lo longitudinal cohort of 2,000 twins followed over 20 years. And if they were gaining weight, they aged faster. If they were losing weight, they aged slower. And it does seem that you know, we, we change a lot with weight loss. And, and, and there was a 
12 week period of caloric restriction before the bariatric surgery and we, we saw significant changes uh, with caloric restriction itself, these wouldn't be interventions that impact the epigenetic clock or they, wouldn't, they haven't been significant so far. So we've, we are um, measuring something different. And then also we looked at exercise. Uh, so we thought that you know, going to the gym um, as much as possible will make you younger. Maybe this is something that the you know, fitness industry will, will utilize because it, it was a research project, it was a clock. Um, and we were wrong. So we did this big study, uh, which actually wasn't published at the end, but we looked at 1,000 people uh, age 40 to 60 going to the gym uh, for, for the very first time in their life. They, they had a sedentary life before then. And we followed them for over a year and all of them kept, kept getting older. Uh, and we didn't understand what was going on, or they were increasing in, in chronic inflammation. And then we looked at these smaller groups, uh, 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 sports cohorts, where we had all the other uh, markers as well. And we saw that, for example, if you're doing interval sprints, did, this did work. So this group of men got younger within three months uh, of doing interval sprints. Uh, but when we looked at um, bodybuilding, and this was bodybuilding in women, um, uh, all of them became highly pro-inflammatory. We looked at gene expression here along with the glycans, all other immune cells, and everything was alter altered in a negative way. Uh, the ones which were doing caloric restriction at the same time as the exercise regime, they didn't recover this increase in age when we followed them after three months. The ones who were just exercising, they did recover after a period of time. And what's nice is this does correlate <laughs> with, with data that's already out there that a certain dose of strength training is positive and it reduces all-cause mortality by 10 to 20 percent. But actually, um, overdoing it, or this is exercising more than three hours per week uh, of strength training, actually increases uh, all-cause mortality by 10 percent. And of course, this is very individual. You know, we have athletes who have phenomenal scores, so it, it doesn't really uh, impact everybody. Uh, so can we use these to evaluate lifestyle to start with? Hopefully, yes, because these interventions are known to have a positive impact. But how about drugs? So the difficulty with, uh, well, particularly some of the new drugs is we don't have this uh, historical data. Uh, the only drug we evaluated so far is uh, estrogen, and it was a very nicely designed trial. So they knocked out hormones uh, in, a, in a cohort of women, half went on the... Um, estrogen patches and half were on uh, placebo. And, and the placebo ages nine years within uh, five months, while the estrogen patches stay in a healthy range. Uh, and we do see the same with therapy. Um, uh, well, transdermal HRT postmenopause, and this does also correlate with other data out there looking at transdermal HRT, uh, which reduces all-cause mortality. Uh, and there's p potentially uh, an age difference. So now we're trying to see if you know, starting it around menopause versus starting it five, ten years later will have a different impact on the uh, clock. Uh, but to truly get there and evaluate this, so for example, metformin, are we hacking the clocks or will it actually have an impact on, on long-term health for an individual? And yes, we have you know, lots of individual examples, but that's not good enough. We need a trial, we need real science that can prove if these therapies are actually making a difference. It needs to be collaborative, so it, it can't be just glycans. We would love to contribute glycan data uh, to these trials, but it really has to look at all of the different um, multi-omics clocks. Uh, and we need a follow-up. So we need a follow-up in uh, five, 10 years' time to see if we've actually uh, had an impact on outcomes, and then finally fully validate these clocks so we can apply, apply them in all of these um, future trials, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Anybody? Yeah. Um, how, how stable is the glycan age clock within an individual if you do three trials in the same day or different times yeah. of day a week? Half life is three weeks, uh, so it's pretty stable in a short term uh, time frame. Even if you look at longitudinal cohorts, and we have a lot of them, the average person ages a year per year. So even if you see here, you know, he was tested here three, weeks, three years later, he's aging a year per year, and this is what we, we see as standard. Right, if, if you took like that middle point where he's 49, um, if you took that, would that be 
you did the same day, but you did more than Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so research we, from plasma, we analyze it once and we have the same result. We do a commercial test, and these are dry blood stains, and we collect four drops because we do them in triplicates. So whenever you see a change in the biological age, it's a, it's a biological change. It, it's not an error margin. Uh, so they're very stable. The only time they accelerate is menopause transition. So in women, we would see that it's more than double the rate of aging we usually see. And this happens before they lose their, their cycle, sometimes years before they lose their cycle. I haven't included these examples here, but I, I can, it, it's quite interesting. Um, and then what, it, it shifts by a decade within a couple of months with the right intervention. If the intervention doesn't work, you're just going to keep getting the same uh, result. So it's a pretty nice, stable, and then also movable if you're impacting the right thing. That's great. I, I asked because I was listening to translating the aging with Morgan Levine, and she was saying the methyl blocks are not reproducible within the same person in the same day. So it yeah. sounds like this is maybe a better. I think some of the first ones, I think they fixed that problem uh, in some of the others, but with epigenome, you're looking at a you know, big pool of information, and we don't fully understand you know, what we're looking at and what's driving uh, these clocks. So I think this is the next piece of work to figure out where, is, where are the mechanisms behind it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Anyway. Awesome.